Welcome to Grace Community Church's virtual Sunday service. We are so happy that you're here. We hope that you get encouragement from the word and that you sing very loudly the worship in your house. No matter what you sound like, it's still going to sound awesome. Um, we also just want to say, if you can please take a moment to let us know how these videos have affected your life, and if you're continuing to watch them and share them with friends and family, it would mean a lot to us. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here, and God bless you. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne now boldly and humbly, knowing that we don't deserve your love, we don't deserve your mercy, we don't deserve your forgiveness. But those are things that you have promised us, Lord, and we are grateful. As we open your word now, Father, we ask that you would guide us, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, help us to know you, help us to appropriate the message that you have for us this morning. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let's take up our offering for today. You're going to ask for forgiveness? How much would you pay for forgiveness? <laughs> That's how much you got to give. Just kidding. You can't buy it. You can't buy forgiveness. It's not by giving. It's not by religion. It's not by going to more church. It's not by more prayer. It's by honest, contrite admission, humbly with honesty saying, God, I need the forgiveness again. Now, in giving to the Lord, interesting, the sin offering was an offering that was compulsory. You had to do it in order to be uh, back in fellowship with Israel and God. But in the free will offering, it wasn't compulsory. You walked by the tabernacle and they had something called a heave offering. You would take something, throw it over the, the side of the tent. It was called a heave offering. So you're a priest inside of the, the tent and all of a sudden something comes, comes over the wall. Oh, that guy must have done something that God really blessed him with. So give God an offering of thankfulness, an offering of thank you, God. Uh, here's a little something back to you. And uh, we'll pray that God uses it for the continuation of the presentation of His love, His forgiveness through Christ. Hopefully the message of the gospel is going out in ways that do make a difference in the lives of people. Maybe you can share it with others. Maybe they can hear something that maybe our way of presenting the gospel and our way of talking about sin and failure and our way of talking about faith and uh, Christianity, maybe it will resonate with somebody. So some people might like it. Some people might hate it. Somebody's going to listen to what I teach here and they're going to find the heresy in it, I'm sure. But I don't trust in that. I trust in Him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the generosity of people. I pray that you would continue to help us all to not just understand the granting of forgiveness of sin when we come to salvation at the cross of Christ, but that we are dependent on forgiveness all the time. Thank you, Lord. We actually deserve uh, the opposite. David later wrote in one of his other Psalms, if you were to repay us according to what our sins deserves, none of us could stand. So thank you for being merciful. Thank you for not repaying us evil for evil. Thank you for being willing to be magnanimous and forgive us even the most heinous of all sins. Help us to repent of our sins and to do all we can to, to stay away from things that are damaging and, and evil and hateful and help us instead to live lives that are lives of blessing. And not to trust in that, but to trust in the fact that you are a loving, merciful, and especially forgiving God through Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning and welcome to the fifth part of the amazing things that God gives you when you are saved. Um, there's 33 things, according to this one theologian or Frank Benoit's uh, list that he sent me. Some of them, I think, are somewhat repetitive from what I'm gathering, but um, this one, I think, is needs to stand on its own because it's, it's the basis of everything else, okay? So let's read this uh, in Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When you get saved, you have the forgiveness of all sin. Because of this doctrine and this truth in the Scriptures, Many think that it gives people license to sin. Paul the Apostle discusses this uh, in Romans. Shall I sin so that the grace of God might increase? By no means. So it's not a license to sin. It's just an amazing truth that if you really think about it, it's profound. Because since all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, And since we all fall short of the glory of God, and since we're not saved based on our deeds and the the works that we do, because they all are never enough, it just seems like um, sin is a... uh, I, I really think that even in churches we have minimized the seriousness of sin and the the profound nature of what it is inside of us. Most of us would rather sidestep it, not think about the sinfulness inside of me. Nobody likes to think less of themselves, and psychiatry and modern-day counseling tends to emphasize that we are uh, divine and that we have to talk positive to ourselves and think positive and never, never look at ourselves as something um, to be humbled and to be lowered. But the secret to understanding the forgiveness of sin is to really understand what sin really is on its face. 
Sin is a, it's not a thing that you do. Sin goes all the way down into the spiritual DNA of your being. It's not just physical, it's spiritual. It has to do with everything that causes all of the rift between us and God, between our relationships with each other. It's what is the source of evil in our culture and in our time, sin. Sin is anything that falls short of perfection. All have, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But what can we do about it? Nothing. We're imperfect. He has made us a little lower than the angels. We're not gods in the flesh. We're not divine beings in the sense that that would mean that we're like some kind of a deity. We are going to be like Christ, Christ-like, but that's only because of Him. It didn't originate from us. And we don't evolve into deity. You need to understand the forgiveness of sin because when you grasp this tremendous truth, you start having a greater appreciation for what God has done for you, okay? So He grants you the forgiveness of all sin when you're saved, okay? Psalm 25 says, for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. Way back in David the king's life, thousand of years ago, a man lived who loved God and tried to serve God. And in his life, he found that his sin was still there. Even though he loved God and followed God and did great things for God, he slew a giant, he, he became the heir apparent to the king, kingship of Israel, he still found that sin was in him. So he cries out to God. It really is a personal issue. It's not a theoretical, let's talk about sin in a general sense and what it does to humanity. It's personal. We all have it. If you're honest, you have sin. And sin is an infection it's just like when you get sick with whatever, you've got it, whatever it is. Um, and you can't do anything about it other than try to deal with it. In this case, he's crying out to God. It's a personal cry. For your name's sake, for your sake, God, not for me. Pardon my sin. It's great. So he came to this place where he realized the enormity of his guilt and his failure in front of God. Now, some think that he's talking here about the sin with Bathsheba. I don't know. He may be talking about something else because the longer I li live life, the more I realize that sin, it's through and through in our hearts and in our minds. And whether we think we've overcome it or not, well, I haven't done really bad stuff for a long time. It's not the issue of doing a bad thing. Sin is inside of us in the most profound place of our hearts. Sin is rebellion against God and a chafing against what He is doing and what His will is. It is a, an infection that is spiritual. It came through Lucifer in the Garden of Eden and it was passed on to all of us. In Jeremiah 14, 7, Jeremiah says here, he's a prophet who is active during Israel's, uh, the beginning of Israel's demise. By the time Jeremiah is finished with his public ministry, Israel has ceased to exist. They are conquered, they are taken captive, and they are deported to Babylon. He sees it with his own eyes. He writes the book of Lamentations over it. In his ministry, God tells him, I'm going to send you to them. They're hard. I'm going to make you harder. They're inflexible. I'm going to make you more inflexible. Um, but I'm young and I can't do it. Don't say that you're young. I can make you strong. Jeremiah is called by other writers the crying prophet. The ministry of Jeremiah didn't produce any converts. He had one scribe who would work with him. Everybody else didn't like him. They shunned him. They threw him into a pit. They treated him badly. He was rebuked by his own king, but yet saved by his king for some reason. The king of Babylon, who deported all of the Jewish people to slavery, sent forth an edict that said, 
take care of this one man named Jeremiah. He had a real sad ministry. The crying prophet. Lamentations is all about him crying. And one time he actually says in the book of Jeremiah, God, you have deceived me. You've, you've sent me out to tell them about you and you're just going to destroy them. And he just felt really saddened about the condition of mankind. So here's one little insight into what he was thinking. Oh, Lord, our iniquities. Notice how a prophet, a true prophet, doesn't say their iniquities, their sins. Ours. It's our country. It's our people. It's our, um, my family. It's me. Our iniquities testify against us. Do thou it for thy name's sake, for our backslidings are many. We have sinned against thee. Do thou what? Forgive. Forgive us. Daniel the prophet in Babylon, when he finally realizes that God's going to fulfill his promise about restoring them back to Israel, he writes, Oh Lord, our sins are great. Forgive us. We've done all these things, even though he himself personally never did them. He learned the ministry of intercession for people. You may think that you haven't done all that they're doing out there, but you're, we're, we're in this world right now. We're part of the humanity all around us. We must intercede. We must pray. We're part of it, okay? Now, Colossians says, Give thanks unto the Father, who has made us meet to be partakers of the, of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Paul the Apostle also is realizing that when we look at humanity and we look at sin and we look at disobedience and we look at failures in front of God and we see it on a general sense with people all around us. But then we realize, wow, it's in me too. And guess what? When I came to Christ, he even forgave my sins. Maybe you don't think that your sins are a big part of the problem, but they're a big enough part and you need to be forgiven as anyone else. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others who forgive who sin against us. Jesus is instructing us. The Bible instructs us that we need to be forgiven. And you get, you get given forgiveness when you are saved. Total, complete forgiveness. So complete that it almost sounds too good to be true. Colossians 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism, you are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Remember, I taught, with, taught you about this in the resurrection, uh, the power of the resurrection sermon series, where when Christ rose, you rose. You are risen with him, it says here. You are risen with him through faith. When he rose, you rose. It's an amazing concept. With him through the faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. In other words, be honest with the, what you were before you knew God. Maybe you know God and have known him for some time now. But if anything that you've learned in knowing God, you should have learned this. That even in my knowing of God, I have not lived my life in a way that has been spotless or sinless. But I was completely dead before I believed in God. I didn't believe in Him. I didn't follow Him. And then He quickened us, that's made alive again, together with Him, with Christ. When? When He forgave you all your trespasses. When did that happen? When He died on the cross. He forgave you all your trespasses. Now look what it says here. He blotted out the handwriting. He took an eraser and He erased the, the charges that were against you. Have you ever gone to court and you've been charged with something? It's as if the judge took, judge took it and tore it up. He erases it. And when does he do it? At the cross. He took it out of the way by nailing it to the cross. All of your sins, all of your failures, all of your imperfections, even as a Christian, God has forgiven. He didn't just forgive the sins you did in the past before you got saved. He also forgives your, your present sins. People think, oh, I'm not in sin right now. If you really look inside of your head and think of your thoughts, the way they think, the way your attitude is, sin, like I said, it's, 
It's profound inside of us. It's to the bone. It's all the way down to a, the very center of our being. We're always kind of in a state of sin, but God has forgiven us of past, present, and future sins. Future sins? Does that give me license then to sin? No, it anticipates the fact that you will sin. Obviously, you will sin. In case you don't think that you will, God told the Israelites, if you do a sin that you didn't know you did or that you're going to do, here's the sacrifice. It's called the sacrifice for the sin of omission. Sins for uh, sacrifices for sins that you didn't even know you did. Sins of omission. In other words, you should have done this, but you didn't, so that was a sin. If you really look at sin from the perspective of God, not us, God, we, we are always in a sin nature kind of a sin scenario. We never, even as Christians, we never do everything we're supposed to do perfectly the way God would do it. We're not sinless like Jesus Christ. He's the only sinless one. Even after the church was born, Peter had to be rebuked by the Apostle Paul in front of the leadership of the church because he was uh, kowtowing favor with some of the, the haves in Jewish culture. So Paul rebuked him. We're sinful. And you need to understand that he forgives sin. And when you understand this, see, you can't understand the 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 profoundness and the amazing truth of the forgiveness of sin unless you understand the, the nature of it, how deep it really is, how big of a problem it really is. We are dismissive of sin, especially in our culture. We have legalized sin. And I'm not just talking about certain things that the courts have decided. I'm saying culturally and even politically and um, with uh, judgments from courts, we have legalized behaviors that for thousands of years have been looked at as wickedness and we have legalized it. I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Your sins are forgiven you. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. You know, I've preached and I've seen this in the scriptures and I've taught about this and I've heard amens said to this by Christians. Amen, amen, I'm forgiven, amen. And look what it says here. Fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. In order to have fellowship with a fellow sinner, that's what fellowship is, in order to be married, Christian marriage, Christian family with a Christian wife or a Christian husband, all it is is having a relationship with a fellow sinner. With the forgiveness of sin, you can therefore have productive relationships because in human relationships, we sin. We fail. We don't accomplish what we should accomplish towards our fellow Christian, our fellow wife or husband or daughter or son or, or friend or neighbor. So people run out of churches. I've seen it over the years. Oh, I don't like so-and-so. I like your teaching, but I can't get along with so-and-so. And I'm like, well, that's what God's teaching you. What do you think Jesus called Simon the Zealot who wanted to kill the Romans at night and Levi the tax collector and put them in discipleship together? Why? Because they needed to learn how to fellowship with each other. They didn't even sit next to each other, probably at first. God puts you in contact with people that are not like you, that you don't like. You need to learn how to like the people around you that are sinners and even if they have sinned against you, you need to learn how to forgive and how to uh, go beyond and see beyond like Jesus did. Forgive them for they know not what they do. If you run away from fellowship just because somebody in the fellowship um, treated you wrong and I'm going to get away from them. I'm not going to talk to them. So I'm going to go find another place. And guess what you find? Same old thing. Anywhere you go, there's people. And anywhere there's people, there's sin. And anywhere there's sin, there's problems. Anywhere there's problems, there's a need for reconciliation, forgiveness, working through things. Yeah, but you don't know what so-and-so did to me. I don't. It doesn't matter. I know because I read enough that all manner of wickedness happens and has been done. So what's the answer? Forgiveness. The answer is forgiveness. It's not license or condoning the behavior of the person that did something wrong. 
But forgiveness is the understanding that in order to go forward with a relationship, the only way is for forgiveness to be there. God could not have a relationship with us. We're sinful people. We're sinful beings. How does God maintain relationship with us? I often used to wonder, how did Jesus Christ handle being sinless, living with sinful people? Forgiveness. It's the only way. Forgiveness. It is the offer to see past the failures, past the inconsistencies, and see the ultimate eternal result of a glorified saint. They're not glorified now. They're not perfect now. They will be one day. You don't have the perfect wife, the perfect husband, the perfect marriage, the perfect Christian fellowship. If you think you can find that, then uh, you're in the wrong place because you're spoiling it. I'm a pastor. I've been one for a long time. I've been working in the church since I was 19. And I've seen all kinds of things happen and heard of all kinds of things and experienced all kinds of things and gone up and down myself. And all I can say is this. The only thing that keeps me with Christ and Christ's people is forgiveness. I'd give up. I'd give up if it was just based on the behavior of the people in the churches or the people in the ministries. I'd give up. Because we're fickle, we're inconsistent, we're, we're unforgiving, we're selfish, we're self-centered. I can't do this, they don't let me do that. And it's so childish, so much of it is so childish, so much of it is so uh, immature. Maturity brings us to the place where we're like Christ and we can say, like as he was giving his life for the people, forgive them, they know not what they do. Can't you get there? Can't you finally say, you know what, Lord, please help them, forgive them. Please let me be part of that solution. Please let me turn the other cheek. Please let me go the extra mile. For them, let me do this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship. The light of the fellowship of God. What's the light? Having fellowship with God. How does God have fellowship with us? By forgiveness. That's how you have fellowship with one another. I like God, I just don't like the people. I like God, I don't like the organized church. If you like God because God forgives and loves you and wants to have relationship with you, do you realize that He wants to have relationship with other people too? And do you realize that He puts you in families and in friendships and in circles of neighbors and in uh, places of employment to be around people, to learn how to touch, how to feel, how to forgive, how to go the extra mile? He puts you in that for that purpose. I can't stand so-and-so. Well, you better start learning how to stand them. You better start learning how to work with them, how to pray for them, how to encourage them. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some of the bad things we did, from you know the real big ones, but not the little ones, from the little ones, but not the big ones. No, from all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness, all of it. Why should he forgive all our unrighteousness? Because in order for him to have fellowship with you, he must forgive all unrighteousness. Because even one unforgiveness of any sin in the life of another, of a sinner, precludes them from being able to experience fellowship with him. Jesus here in Luke 7, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, forgiven, the same loveth little. He said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. This is a story in the Gospel of Luke. This happens to be Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She heard that Jesus was in town. He was at the house of a religious leader, a Pharisee, a religious guy. He walks in. He sits down to the meal, and in runs this woman. She runs right in and falls down at his feet and starts to weep. And with her tears, she begins to wet his feet. And with her hair, she begins to dry his feet. And the Pharisee, it says in the Bible, thinks to himself. He thinks it, doesn't say it out loud. Why does he let her touch him? Doesn't he know what kind of woman she is? She was a prostitute, a sinner, a vida loca kind of a person. She looked the part. She was judged that way. And Jesus 
told Simon the Pharisee, he gave him a story about a man who had uh, two servants. One had a lot of debt. One had a little bit of debt. And he goes, so the master forgave both of them the debt. He goes, which one is going to like him more? I guess, I suppose the man with a greater debt. And he said, that's why I say unto you, her sins are many. She had a lot of debt. I have forgiven them. She loved much. In other words, she's showing that she's repented. She's showing that she's sorry. But little, here you are, a Pharisee, and he actually goes into great detail here. You didn't offer me to wash my feet when I walked in. You didn't offer to anoint my head. You didn't treat me with any kind of consideration. But since I came into your house, she's not stopped crying on my feet, drying them with her hair, and asking forgiveness. And then he turns to her, your sins are forgiven. We compare ourselves to people around us. We look at somebody that is way less fortunate than us in life and in experience. And we see that they're a loser. Look what happened to them. Look how messed up they are. Look how low they have fallen. I'm glad it's not me. I mean, there's stories about that in the Bible. Jesus actually talked about this. A man who wouldn't even look into heaven. He just said, Lord, forgive me my sins. Forgive me. And he would beat his chest. And the other one was a religious guy. And he said, I'm such a good guy. I'm not like this guy. Same thing right here. We've been forgiven. A lot of people say they would like to hear the words when they meet the Lord. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. What about these words? Wouldn't you like to hear these words better? Or those words and these words? Because before you can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you have to hear these words. Thy sins are forgiven. And only the Lord can say this. I can't say it. The church can't say it. No human entity or human organization can say it. Only Jesus Christ can say it and mean it and accomplish it. When you are saved, thy sins are forgiven. In the Great Commission, Jesus said repentance and remission of sins. Remission is to, to um, declare them to be of, it's like amnesty, no more sin. It will be preached in his name amongst all nations. That's all people groups, all family groups, all language groups, beginning at Jerusalem. Well, that's precisely what has happened historically. We're way over here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and the gospel went all the way all around the world that came here. Beginning at Jerusalem, what was the message? God wants to forgive your sins, and if you believe in him, he will. It's kind of a neat, amazing truth. To him, all the prophets witness, Acts chapter 10, that through his name, through the name of Jesus Christ, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Whoever. You mean even somebody like Adolf Hitler? If Adolf Hitler ever said, oh, I'm so sorry, God, I'm such a bad guy. I killed all these people. And I ask you, forgive me. We don't have any record that that happened. But God could forgive people like Hitler, he could forgive anyone. He can forgive the most vile, wicked sin that you can imagine. Jesus said all manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men except for blasphemy against the Spirit. And what is that? That is saying, ah, no, I don't believe you can forgive. I don't believe you're going to forgive. I don't accept what you did. That's blasphemy against the Spirit because the Spirit's always moving to try to get you to come to the place where you say, you know what, Lord, I'm a failure. I'm, I'm the thief on the cross. I deserve to be dying. Could you please forgive me? Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus, is preached unto you, what? Theology? Uh, religion? Uh, a new way of looking at life? Uh, a new set of commandments? This is what's preached. The forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. Something that religion can't give you. Something that philosophy can't give you. Uh, heritage can't give you. Family, a lot of times, won't give you forgiveness of sins. Well, you were this, you were that. And we hold these grudges against each other and we refuse to forgive, even though the Lord told us that we should forgive. Be kind unto one another, Ephesians 4.32. Tender-hearted. There's not enough of that in today's world. Forgiving one another. 
Forgive, forgive. How much can, do I have to forgive? Peter asked one time. Seven times? That sounds pretty good. Pharisees, four times. They say four times. How about seven? I'll go seven. And Jesus said, 70 times seven, Peter. As much as it needs done, keep forgiving. Even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. You expect God to forgive you of your sins, don't you? Gallup poll after Gallup poll says most Americans want to go to heaven. How do you get to heaven? By being forgiven. If you expect God to forgive you, why don't you forgive people around you? Why don't you? Because I'm mad at them. I don't like them. They did bad to me. They, they hurt my feelings. It just sounds childish. Come on. Let's grow up. Start forgiving. Let it go. Forgive us our sins. Here's the Lord's Prayer, which isn't the Lord's Prayer. It is the prayer that the Lord gave to the apostles when he, they asked him. After they saw him praying, they said, Lord, uh, can you teach us how to pray? He goes, okay, I'll teach you how to pray. You can't pray like me. I have no sin, but I'll teach you how do you pray. I'll teach you how you can pray. Forgive us our sins. <laughs> As we forgive our debtors, forgive us our sins and lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the end of the Lord's Prayer, we call it. And we repeat that prayer and repeat it. And we don't think about what it means. And look what he says at the end of the prayer. If you forgive, here's his commentary on the prayer. If you forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And what that means is simple. If you truly have received Christ as Savior and you have received the forgiveness of sin into your life, then you will forgive others their sins. If you do not forgive others of their sins and failures, you need to ask yourself if you're truly forgiven, if you're truly saved, because a truly saved individual, man or woman, you're willing to forgive. Again, going back to the fact that having been in the ministry a long, long time and seeing people refuse to forgive, refuse. I wonder, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. I just can't let that go. Okay. What if God does that with you? I just can't let that go, Jimmy. I won't, I'm not going to let you get away with that one. I'm going to hold you to that one. I'm going to stick your nose in it. If that's the way God is, then I'm done. Because there's plenty of things that I've done that he could stick my nose in. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive you yours. It's the proof in the pudding. If you're truly saved, forgiveness flows. If you are not saved, forgiveness halts. That's all. If you're a forgiving person, then the Lord has worked in your heart. If you are not, then you don't understand who he is. Let's read this together. Psalm 51. Here is David's psalm about his sin with Bathsheba. She was married. His army was at war. He knew that her husband was gone with the army. He was up on the top of his palace. He should have been with the army, but he stayed back. He saw her taking a bath on the top of her rooftop. Why were people, why was she doing that? Because in those days, that's what they did, I guess. I don't know. He saw her, he desired her, he called her, and he took her. She sent word back to him, I'm pregnant. Well, that's what happens. Or well, it used to happen until we aborted everything. It would have been an easy solution back then. Huh? I'll just pay for the abortion. Um, so he, the king, King David, he's king after all. He's the head of the government. Sends word to the general, hey, jo Joab, his name was. Send back Uriah the Hittite, her husband. Have him visit. Have him report to me about what's going on with the war. So Joab sends him back on, back to Jerusalem. And he tells David what's going on. And David says, oh, it sounds pretty good. So why don't you go home and, and uh, visit your wife. And then you can go back in the morning. So he's hoping that, you know, all things being natural, he'll go with his wife and they'll have uh, relationships and then he won't have to worry about the pregnancy. Well, he finds out that this man, not even a Jew, is really loyal. He goes to his house, but he sleeps on the doorsteps with the other people because 
he reasons to himself that the rest of the armies out there, they're not with their wives or family, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go in and enjoy uh, relationships right now because uh, I'm going to suffer with them. And the next morning, David finds out that that's what happened. And so he writes a little note, and in the note he says to the general, put this man in the front lines when you attack, so that when they, uh, when in the front lines they resist, I want you to all pull back a little and leave him alone so that he gets slain. So that's what happens. And he does get slain. Him and a few other individuals die in this battle. And so David then takes Bathsheba and he uh, brings her into his life and he proposes marriage to her and he thinks everything is fine and hunky-dory. And God sends his best friend, Nathan the prophet. And Nathan tells him this big story about a, a man who had a bunch of riches and a bunch of sheep. And his friends came over and they wanted to have a dinner. And so the man that was rich had a neighbor who had one little sheep, a neighbor that had one little sheep. And he gets one of his guys to go get that guy's one little sheep kills that little sheep, makes a feast for his friends, and then goes his merry way. David was a shepherd when he was a little boy, and Nathan knew that he this story would have an impact in him. So David gets up and he says, that man needs to die. And then Nathan says, you're that man. You took another man's wife. You had him put to death. You're that man. And it says that David fell down and he cried out for forgiveness. So he writes Psalm 51 because the rest of the story is that the baby dies. David prays all night. The baby's born. The baby's sick. David prays, oh God, you know, it's my fault. It's not his fault. And the baby dies. The innocent died. And then David gets up and they have a funeral and then they they get things going again, but real, real consequence falls upon him and Israel and the family. So he writes Psalm 51. And Psalm 51 is a cry for forgiveness. Psalm 51 is an acknowledgement of great failure. So let's read this together. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. So he's acknowledging this. He's admitting this. He's not covering it up. He's not hiding it. He's acknowledging it. And he's appealing to God on the basis of God's mercy. That's how you have to approach God concerning sin and failure in your life. Uh, on his mercy. Be honest don't cover it up. Don't try to because God knows all about it. Notice what he says here. Against you and you only have I sinned. Well, you could ask Bathsheba. You could ask the baby. You could ask the men that died with Uriah. You could ask Uriah. The consequence of his behavior resulted in their deaths. But he says here, only you. You're the one that I've sinned against. In reality, when we sin, you might hurt other people. And yeah, it'll have consequence on them. But ultimately, the consequence is the relationship between you and God. Against you have I sinned. I've done this evil in your sight. In your sight, I, I did this. You, I knew you could see all of this. I knew it. I did it right in front of you. That you may be found just when you speak, blameless when you judge. Nobody can hide. Nobody can justify it. Nobody can sweep it under the rug in front of God. Because not only does he know the deed, he knows the motive, he knows the thoughts, he knows everything behind it all he does. So don't hide it. Why hide it? He knows all about it. Be honest with him. It doesn't matter if any one other human being knows about it. It's him. You have to deal with him. He's God. He's your Savior. He's the one that, has to, that you have to come in front of. So do it now. Don't wait until then. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He's, he's stating the obvious. I was born in sin. 
In sin, my mother conceived me. He doesn't mean that it was sin that his mother got pregnant and had a baby. He means that the sin nature that I was, that I inherited came when I was conceived. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. That's a theology, by the way, of the sin nature of Adam is passed to every human being. And we get it from the moment we come into existence. When you're conceived, in the hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. So let's keep, keep reading. Purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was the plant that looked like a big broccoli plant that the high priest would take and dip into the blood and sprinkle on the altar. And I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And here's that song that all of us like to sing. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. So we're forgiven of sin with the Lord God. Even the most heinous, wicked, evil sin God has forgiven. Notice what he continues to say, O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice. It's not religious stuff that you want. What you desire is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. What's he looking for? For you to go do a sacrifice or to try to make God happy by doing something nice? What he's looking for is for you to recognize the failure and for you to say, okay, God, I blew it. Like the thief on the cross, I blew it. Forgive me. And that's what you'll get. Forgiveness. When you get saved, you get the forgiveness of sin. Let's pray. Well, Lord, I don't know how that sermon came off. I never know. It's your word. We read about David. We read about others. But then we live our lives, and we find that we are no different than them. Indeed, we have probably crossed the line even worse than they. So, Lord, we need forgiveness, and you've given it freely in the sacrifice of Christ. And when we are saved, our forgiveness is complete. All sins past, all sins present, and all sins future. It is too good to even think to be true, but it is true. You forgive for your own sake, you forgive. For the sake of Christ, you forgive. For the sake of fellowship, you forgive. You forgive because it's the only way that you can still love Jimmy Sandoval. Without forgiveness, I'd have to quit. I'd have to be cast away into outer darkness. But with forgiveness, I can continue with you. I can continue to praise you and love you and serve you. Even though I fail, I fail, I fail. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Standing on your side Holding your
We really appreciate you being here with us today. Over the last year and, and change that we've been making these videos for you, we've really grown as a worship team and we've grown as a church. And we really appreciate your support and being here with us. If you like what you're hearing, please hit the subscribe button or the like button on YouTube or and Facebook. And uh, keep tuning in. And until next time, God bless.